OK, we're back. Um, I'd like to, uh, to welcome you to our panel discussion. Again, for all those following us uh, at Pacific Day on Twitter, it's at Pacific Partners DC and hashtag CSIS Live. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the senior advisor and co-director of the Pacific Partners Initiative at CSIS. And uh, we want to thank uh, uh, the Washington Pacific Committee, which uh, comprises of the Washington and New York-based embassies, uh, missions, and representative offices of the Pacific Islands for hosting us today. And special thanks to Fiji Airways for, for being our sponsor today. We've got a great panel. Uh, and I intend to introduce them, and I'm going to ask them some questions. And, on, and, and today, I really would like to welcome the audience to participate and ask these, uh, these experts some questions. Uh, this is the first Pacific Day uh, where I have uh, uh, not, have, haven't seen a bunch of hands go up the minute I, I open the floor. So I hope you guys uh, were just having your Fiji water, uh, and, and now you're ready to participate with me. On my right is Kieran Ahuja. She's the executive director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. She previously served as executive director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and was a trial attorney for the US Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division. On my left, uh, this is the Ulu uh, of Tokelau. He serves as the chancellor of the University of the South Pacific in addition to his uh, other roles, and he's previously served as Tokelau's Minister for Health and Support Services. On my far right is Craig Hawk, who's flown in from New Zealand. He is New Zealand's Deputy Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Trade for International Development, and he manages New Zealand's aid program and advises the government on international development issues. Welcome, Craig. On, on second to my left is uh, Edgar uh, Kagan. He's a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the State Department's Bureau of East Asian and, and Pacific Affairs, responsible for relations with Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. And last but not least, on my far left, Adam Schumacher is Director of the Office of East Asian and Pacific Affairs at USAID and has uh, responsibility for the, uh, the Pacific islands, among other regions. I'd like to open up the floor with a first question to Kieran. Um, to your ear, uh, sitting at the White House, you heard an incredible, uh, I think, speech by the Prime Minister. <coughs> a lot of issues about the Pacific and American interests there. You've dealt with Pacific uh, Island, uh, Pacific Islanders who are Americans. You know, the Pacific, we are part of the Pacific in the United States. How, do you th how does the White House think about these issues and the connectivity between uh, the, the Americans who are Pacific Islanders, American interests in the region, and, and the region itself? Sure, well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be a part of uh, this conversation. Um, I will do a little bit of self-promotion. Um, I am um, celebrating my birthday today. Wow, happy birthday. So. <laughs> Oh, another person there. Wonderful. Oh, okay, yeah. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, I won't share my age, but um, <laughs> it is wonderful to be celebrating along with Pacific Day 2013, um, to be here with you. Um, I've, you know, we uh, have had, I've had my full day here spending time with everyone, and it's really been a wonderful conversation um, with many of, uh, of the individuals um, here from the Pacific, and I, um, you know, would like to share, I guess, initially a little bit about the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders um, and why it's so particularly important to the president uh, that this initiative was reestablished when he um, first came into office. And it really is a lot about what we are talking about today, uh, why uh, both the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities are so incredibly important um, to this president. Um, of course, many of you know he has very deep roots in the Pacific. Um, and, uh, and I know when I have gone to visit, especially in Hawaii, they consider him a son of Hawaii um, and have a very deep love and appreciation uh, for our president. Uh, his family members hail from Asia Pacific. Uh, 
And you know, some of us joke that he spent more time living in the Pacific than many of us. Um, and so uh, I think you know, not only his personal relationships, but also what we've seen, um, really the transformation that has taken place across this country, uh, that we have seen a tremendous uh, demographic growth of the Pacific Islander community. Um, just in the 2010 census numbers, uh, this, uh, this community has grown by leaps and bounds. It is now 1.2 million. Uh, currently, I've learned as recently as just uh, last year, it is now 1.4 million. Uh, what's, what's more interesting, I think, just in the numbers, it's growing at 60%, which is more than double the national average, uh, is that we are seeing communities in places like Arkansas, where there are more than 11,000 Marshallese Americans in those communities, uh, in the South, uh, in Utah. And as a part of the work that we do with the initiative, um, we work with so many different federal agencies across the government um, on a number of different issues from education to health uh, to increasing diversity in the federal government. Um, and these issues are at the core um, of a lot of the work that we find is particularly important for this community. Um, we're seeing just as many Pacific Islanders here on the continent, especially those uh, that we have relationships with, relationships with whether the territories or the freely associated states, as those um, on the islands themselves. Um, and a part of that conversation is how do we build the relationships between uh, Pacific Americans and others? Um, and then as a part of my work, how do we build those bridges even more, you know, even within the Asian Pacific community? Um, I have to tell you that as a part of this initiative, um, that I got a lot of pushback from the Pacific Islander community um, about not being forgotten and left out of this larger Asia Pacific relationship. Um, and we have made every effort that we can to talk about the issues um, that are particularly important for communities here um, uh, on the continent. Uh, a large part of our portfolio is domestic. Uh, the president's been very clear when he created this initiative that no community should be invisible to its government. And we take that very seriously. And so part of that is building the diversity in the federal workforce pipeline. So, you know, we can talk about these issues, and certainly if you're from these parts of the world, it matters, but what about to the rest of the country? And I can tell you that the folks in Arkansas who are getting to know the Marshallese now know a little bit about the Pacific region because of the people that they are engaging with. Um, we are also um, very engaged around the work around data and research uh, because of the importance of, of counting individuals not only on the islands and also here um, to make sure that there is the proper representation because numbers equal resources. Um, to be able to provide those numbers in a way that shows the need that exists in the community. Um, and then also working more broadly on education and health issues um, that are a particular concern here um, in the U.S. for Pacific Americans, um, certainly around some of the health and education disparities. You know, we often talk about, uh, and this is a conversation that we have within the federal government, and I'll just be very honest with you that um, usually my conversation starts with So there's work that we need to do within the federal government to understand um, who these communities are, um, their culture, their background, um, the needs that they have in the community. And I think for us, what we've tried to do is also raise up some of those challenges within those communities. Within those communities. So 15% of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have a college uh, degree. Only 15%. So for us, you know, what are we doing to address those issues? And we can even take that when it comes to talking about health disparities around obesity and heart disease. So I just, you know, really more for conversation later, yeah. pushing out some of those nuggets of some of those issues that we've been working on and, and look forward to a more kind of in-depth conversation with all of you. Well, I want to thank you very much. I want to 
take this idea, and, and I'm going to turn to um, to Edgar because uh, I, I think there's a question here that, uh, that that's been raised, and that's the question is, has the pivot, the American pivot to the Asia Pacific, extended to the Pacific? Uh, and certainly, you know, with Secretary Clinton uh, at the PIF, you know, I guess you could make the case that it that it has happened, but can that be sustained? Is it dependent on people? Uh, are we restricted by uh, money? Uh, or will we be able to carry this on? And, and, and what would it take uh, to, for us to do that? Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank the uh, committee, as well as uh, Ambassador Moore and, uh, Australian, and the New Zealand Embassy for your, uh, inviting me here. Um, I think what you touched on is, of course, it's a very part of I mean, the short answer is yes. The pivot, or as we have been retrained to say, rebalance, <laughs> um, is, is of course it's the Asia-Pacific rebalance, um, and the Pacific is an important part of this. And I think for most people here, you're well aware that for many years, truth is, we said Asia-Pacific with a capital A and a lowercase p. And one of the challenges that we've faced in the last few years has been to try and change that, in recognition of the fact that our engagement in the Pacific is very important to our broader engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we have you know, obviously done a number of things, and you've alluded to one of them, which of course has been the highest profile, which is Secretary Clinton's attendance at last year's post forum dialogue at the Pacific Island Forum. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, to sort of couch this in broader terms. Um, this wasn't something that just came out of nowhere. Uh, in, in, num in the preceding years, we'd done a number of things. One was Secretary Clinton started meeting Pacific leaders on the margins of the UN General Assembly. And, uh, also, uh, we ramped up the size of our delegation to have more interagency participation to recognize that our engagement with the region really is sort of a whole of government effort. Um, that's particularly true with the freely associated states, but it's really remarkably true with the rest of the Pacific region. Uh, we also did a number of things, including when the region made very clear the importance of reopening a USAID office in the region. We responded by opening an office in uh, Port Moresby. Uh, also, Deputy Secretary Nides uh, but was at the time the highest level U.S. attendee at the Pacific Islands Forum in 2011, um, leading a, a delegation of over 50 people, which again was done in recognition of the importance of this broader engagement. Um, we see, realizing the importance, understanding the importance of climate change, we have sought to target a, a increased assistance to the region in the areas of climate change, and we've tried very hard to make sure that the engagement has been as broad-based as possible. Um, we've looked at areas, for instance, dealing with fisheries, also trying to expand cooperation on uh, ship rider agreements where U.S. Coast Guard, now expanding to the Navy, um, can help uh, countries in the region enforce some of their EEZ regulations. Uh, so these are things which we see as part and parcel of making sure that the rebalance covers the Pacific region. And we think this is important for a number of reasons. One is the U.S. has a long-standing historical and moral responsibility in the region. In, it's worth remembering that last year was the 70th anniversary of the landing in Guadalcanal, um, and that we're now celebrating a number of very important 70th anniversaries, which remind us of some of, some of the history of U.S. engagement in the region and what brought us there. Um, it's also important to recognize that the region is important partners in international organizations. Um, we depend very much on the values-based votes of the region, which is truly committed to democracy. Um, in the four like the UN, in both in New York and in Geneva. And so this is part of the broader engagement that we have and that we want to try and sustain. Now, I mean, very candidly, four years ago, what we heard was the U.S. isn't engaged enough in the region. We still hear that. But now what we hear more of is you've done more, you've stepped up, can you sustain it? And the reality is that whatever I say or people like me say, no one's going to believe it. I mean, it, it, words aren't going to do it. We have to actually show through our continued actions that we are stepping up, that we are going to continue to engage. We, you know, we're not going to oversell what we're going to do. We're not going to solve all the problems, and we will probably never do as much as the region wants us to do. But the key is, can we continue to do more, and can we continue to do it in a way that genuinely respects the region's interests and concerns and does it as partners? And I think that you know, we will do our best to do that. And you know, candidly, you know, whatever I say doesn't matter because people in the region are sophisticated enough to realize that the test is what we do, and hopefully we'll come through in the coming years and make clear that the Pacific is a very integral part of the rebalance of the Asia-Pacific region. 
you make the point that the Pacific is an integral part of the rebalance. And I wanted to turn to uh, Ulu uh, and ask him for his, uh, his take on the idea of the, of the, Asia Paci or the uh, community of Pacific Islands being uh, a hub in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I wondered if you could talk to that. Minister Puna of Cook Islands and the current chair of the Pacific uh, Leaders Forum. Ambassador Mike Moore, Excellencies and Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, and Friends of the Pacific. I bring greetings and salutations from our part of the Pacific, from the elders and people of my homeland, Tokelau, Malo. Uh, in relation to the questions, uh, the Galawans are recorded as one of the oldest Pacific communities in the U.S. Diverse, uh, diverse society. Most of our people who live in Hawaii and the territory of American Samoa since 1950s and are U.S. citizens or nationals and have contributed positively through the various sectors that they serve in, especially in military, fisheries and production uh, services. We have close family and trade links with American Samoa. We are, for example, exploring fishing opportunities with a firm with facilities in American Samoa. If the venture proceeds, it will be a, a tangible demonstration of our contribution to the U.S. society through jobs, trade and people. Given the scale of the U.S., everything we do in tiny, in tiny for the U.S. yet, for us, it's huge. In 2005, the Galawans living in Hawaii benefited from a grant by the administration of Native Americans in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Service intended to help preserve the Tagalawans' language and culture. Pacific Islanders or descendants of Pacific Islanders in the U.S. society are participating more in the U.S. society. Thank you, uh, Coordinator. Thank you very much. Adam, uh, uh, he mentioned a little bit about uh, American participation. I wondered if, uh, if you could talk a little bit about on-the-ground engagement uh, you, you're with USAID. Uh, what are we doing uh, to, to assist uh, these communities uh, in their efforts to uh, fight climate, the, the onset of climate change, uh, renewable energy, some of these areas? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, needless to say, with the establishment of the uh, office, our office in uh, Port Mosby, it gave us the, a much better capacity to be able to coordinate with donors, governments, um, and local communities and we're really seeing that um, take, uh, transpire right now with some of our programs. Um, we've, uh, just last year, we signed a uh, MOU with uh, New Zealand on the Kiribati uh, Solid Waste Management Initiative. Um, that is going to um, re provide solid waste services to over 80% of the population there. And that's really a combination of working with the local population, uh, the government, and with um, a donor that frankly has a more experience than we do working in the region. Um, as in other areas, um, in terms of every approach with development, we're trying to take a balanced approach, both uh, working with government and local communities to make sure that it's more sustainable. So in other programs such as uh, what we're working in Papua New Guinea with uh, mangrove forests, again, um, we're working with local communities on public awareness. Um, about the importance of uh, replanting trees and um, actually putting local populations to work and planting trees and helping uh, reach the government's goal of uh, um, one, planting one million uh, new trees over the next uh, three years. So um, we're also 
an understanding trying to uh, broaden our partner base that we're not just focused on working with governments, but also with uh, academic institutions um, and trying to engage with the private sector. So uh, much like, as I mentioned, with the mangrove forest program, uh, we're also working with the local university, uh, with the Papua New Guinea University on building their capacity to help the government make uh, more informed decisions through research and data collection. Um, looking ahead, we're, while we have a, what we consider very strong partnerships with New Zealand and Australia, um, we'd like to move more from a coordination role with uh, other donors such as JICA, um, ADB, and um, perhaps China to more of a collaboration that we have right now. Collaboration is really important, and it's, it's something I want to touch on with Craig. Uh, Craig, you're heading up New Zealand's aid agency, and you've done some pretty innovative things in the Pacific, also also trying to get China to, to get involved. The Prime Minister talked a little bit about this when he spoke. Um, what about collaboration uh, to assist uh, in, in development in the Pacific? Oh, kia ora and um, warm uh, Pacific greetings. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for dragging me away from a cold Wellington New Zealand winter so I can come over here to Washington. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> my, the temperature has gone up <laughs> very high. But um, I think um, I want to start off just by saying, um, picking up on Kieran's comments around what the, I guess, the Pacific Islands community looked like. Um, writ large in, in the United States and say, made me think about the parallels in New Zealand, mm -hmm. that New Zealand has a very large Pacifica community and it's very, very diverse. But it also um, keeps changing. Um, and uh, while we have now third and fourth generation Pacific Islanders living in New Zealand and very much um, it's, it's, it's home, um, we recently um, put in place a seasonal workers scheme um, where we've had um, a lot of Pacific Island countries, uh, 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 people, about 7,000 of them um, per year, have come down to New Zealand and they're working in the horticulture area. And they've actually gone to small town Heartland, New Zealand. And again, that, that your connection around Arkansas and um, uh, the Marshallese there, it's also brought another dynamic and a, another dimension to the New Zealand community. Um, not only that for New Zealanders, but also it's provided them with revenue, um, jobs, and income. They've taken back um, to their countries of origin, and it's allowed them to invest in small businesses um, or uh, um, housing um, for their families. So again, there's a very nice win-win, um, and that, I guess that I'm using that also in a, in a taking liberty around collaboration. But, but more generally, uh, I think in the collaboration space, um, what we're really interested in, we're interested in working with anyone um, because the most important thing for us is that results matter. Changing lives um, or saving lives is really what we're interested in working um, in the region. Um, and that means we're very welcoming of, of partnerships um, and we, we are very much um, uh, looking around collaboration um, with various kind of um, um, international organisations or countries. I want to mention a, a couple of things, and the Prime Minister has already picked these up around the renewable energy area. And I just want to provide a little bit of context around that. Um, I want to say that the region is a place of opportunities, and in many cases we talk about some of the constraints and the challenges, and they are really real, and they are big challenges for a region of ocean and um, many small islands. But there are great opportunities out there where we get together as an international community and we support um, um, the countries of, of the region. And uh, in renewable energy, um, the, the, the region recently had a, a meeting in Auckland, the Pacific Energy Summit. That was designed to shine a spotlight on the issue of renewable energy. And 10% of the region's GDP was going on um, imported fuel sources. Now that money, um, over time, when we increase the amount of renewable energy, it will be able to be diverted into service delivery for education and health. So we're on a journey, we're on a path, and uh, you know, to 50% renewable over time. Um, and that's truly um, been a, a, a global effort. Um, it's involved the private sector, it's involved aid agencies, and it's also um, involved non-government organizations, um, it's involved the banks. So I think that's a very important one around how collaboration together when we pool our resources can make a difference. 
in the other area, just I'd like to just um, uh, uh, mention, uh, sure. is around the water partnership. Um, and the Prime Minister, again, this is working with China, New Zealand, and the Cook Islands. And to say, why are we doing it? And the first thing we're doing it, because the Cook Islands asked us, mm -hmm. that was the first reason. Um, <laughs> the second reason we're doing it is because um, we wanted to try and work with China in the Pacific, uh, and we want to learn from China, and we hope China will be able to learn with us. We are a year into the partnership. Um, it's about a four-year partnership. We'll finish in 2016. Um, in the first year, we've really set up the frameworks, and the governance, and so it's been the hard yards of getting to know each other, building trust, confidence. Um, we have a whole set of range of, um, of uh, formal governance levels right down to sort of um, smaller technical working groups. Hopefully, as the Prime Minister said, uh, in the next few months, we're about to start the actual um, uh, digging in the, in the ground. Um, but uh, we see that partnership as a real opportunity to uh, see if we can work with China in the region, if we can improve results on the ground, both in terms of our work, but also the, our work that they're doing in the region. So that's why I think collaboration is important and uh, it can make a difference. We, uh, you know, we've, we've studied Chinese development aid at CSIS. We found it, it's, it's really driven uh, by uh, their commerce ministry. Uh, it's very much about employing Chinese companies and Chinese labor. Was that the case in the Cook Islands in your collaboration with the Cook Islands, or did did you uh, were you able to get China to think in a sort of a new way in terms of its approach? I think it's small steps. So it's a partnership also with um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with Mofcom, I see. and it's also with a Chinese um, construction company, um, and then it's also some New Zealand uh, um, companies that will be involved in the I guess the quality assurance, mm. um, but also uh, I think. Prime Minister also picked this up in terms of our engagement with China, starting to look at local labour content and how you can actually um, maximise and use, I guess, local businesses. And they're open to that kind of conversation. So yes, the heart of it still is a Chinese construction company, but there is now looking at um, the design, looking at the standards that we employed, um, which has a, has a New Zealand um, component to it, and then also looking at possible local labour within them. And I think also the Cook Islands, and I think Tonga, have been very successful in getting local labor um, content into some of the Chinese construction contracts. A senior, uh, a very a senior minister from Southeast Asia told me, we'll believe the United States has a sustained rebalance and refocus on, a on the Asia Pacific when your leadership starts to talk to Americans about why Asia is important to the United States. And um, I wanted to ask Kieran, I, I guess, the, s the sense is, you know, are we part of the Asia Pacific? Has that? How are we building that political foundation so that the consciousness, political consciousness, of the United States uh, has the mindset that we are part of it? And and what would it take to do that? To build, build political consciousness here in the yes. U.S. I don't get to ask these individuals here, <laughs> but. Um, at least from the, the communities that we are engaging with, there is, um, I think there's great interest. I think, you know, interestingly enough, where we're seeing it is actually within the business community. Okay. Um, if you're from Super. that particular region, um, individuals are organizing their own trade summits. Um, they're uh, very excited. We've done events at the White House uh, around a pivot to Asia Pacific. Uh, because they see, they see real opportunities. So I think, of course, there is a little bit of that vested interest, um, yeah. whether business or personal interest. Um, and I do think, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 I was, you know, I was kind of mulling this over because oftentimes when you have the policy discussions or when you, when you talk about some of these issues, it can be a little bit, little bit humdrum. And I was thinking, you know, this is a little different from um, just focusing on the Pacific, but, you know, my family's from India. And, and I have to say, you know, the way India has become popular is through Bollywood, right? So yeah. through kind of this, this, this kind of pop culture and movies and, and not, you know, there's different ways that we find our, well, find our way into um, kind of the hearts and minds of, of communities. And certainly it could be the personal relationships. Uh, you know, the president has gone out and spoken um, about, uh, you know, has spoken at events where, um, You've seen a, tr um, a really uh, large gathering of Asian, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders 
Uh, you know, we've seen a, even just a tremendous growth within, you know, and, and numbers of, uh, of members of Congress with, you know, in this recent election uh, yeah. of representing these communities who are, you know, now second and third generation. Uh, you know, I always joke that my family had, well, my parents had kind of one foot out and one foot in. Um, now we're kind of, at least some of us are all in, but I think that uh, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good question. I don't think I necessarily have like a complete answer okay. for it, but Fair just enough. some examples. Yeah. The, uh, you, know, you wonder whether innovation and technology, you know, people, the stories of people innovating and solving the problems in the Pacific might capture the, uh, the imagination of Americans, maybe from business, maybe from sort of a, a science point of view. Uh, I want to ask the Ulu, you, I, I heard, uh, and I'd like to know if it's true, that the Tokelau has gone fully to 100% renewable energy. Is that true? And, and if so, how did you do that? Yes, um, the future should be committed uh, to renewable energy. And Tokelau became the first nation in the world to have all its electricity powered entirely by solar energy. We are tiny and we do not produce much CO2, yet we are greatly threatened by the impact of climate change. We therefore ask ourselves what we can do, and we are now producing virtually all of our electricity requirements from solar energy, more than 90%. It will be 100% if we did not have the uh, occasional cyclone or cloudy uh, period. <laughs> We also manage our electricity demand. Electric cookers are banned. Air conditioners are banned. Appliances which may hear today take for granted do not make it to talk aloud. Work towards renewable energy should not only be motivated by profit, but by a genuine commitment to an environment friendly quality of life. We owe this to the future. Wow, that's a great, uh, that's a great Okay, I need your help. I, I'd like to get some questions and, and thoughts from the audience. So just please identify yourself. We have people with mics and ooh, this uh, young lady in the front here. Good evening. I am a Micronesian, specifically from the island of Guam. My home now is Maryland but my heart is still on the island of Guam. But not just the island of Guam, but all the South Pacific Islands. Because when I served in the US Army, I had Samoans and Tongans and Saipanese next to me during those battles that I served. So I'm very concerned. I have two major issues and concerns with the South Pacific Islands. It's the climate change, number one. Yeah. The climate change, is the State Department, the Department of Interior, the White House Initiative, and anyone else in the political status of the United States government ready, ready for a mass exodus or even a small mass exodus of Pacific Islanders to move out of their homes because of the climate change? Because the water is still rising and the ocean is still getting hot. And when the ocean is hot, it kills our reef. And I know in my island in Guam, we are surrounded by coral reef. And that reef is dying. That means we're gonna have waves and Kalabunga like Hawaii. We'll be able to surf like Hawaii because the ocean's gonna come to our island. But I'm very concerned about the low-lying islands like Marshall Islands, Caroline Islands, Palau, Trot. I'm concerned about them. It's the United States who is responsible for the islands in the South Pacific in some form or fashion. Are they ready? Is there a vision plan, a 2020 vision plan to move those people somewhere? The people in the South Pacific has taken refugees from the Vietnam War, refugees from the Iraq War, refugees from Afghanistan War. Is the United States going to be ready to take Pacific Islanders as refugees into the United States? Are they? I don't know. And I hope there is a vision 2020. The other major concern I have is every year thousands of veterans in the United States military swear in who are not U.S. citizens to be U.S. citizens, thousands. 
Within that thousands are Pacific Islanders. In 2003, a young man from Kortere went to Iraq, lost his leg and lost his arm. He's in Kortere in Micronesia area. He has to go to Hawaii to get treatment. The people in Guam, it's eight hours to get to Hawaii for treatment. It's only two and a half to get to the Philippines, but we don't have a memorandum agreement with their medical for the veterans. The soldiers deserve the same rights and privileges as the soldiers in the United States. But when they go home, one political status is taken away. They can't vote for president. Yet they serve that president. They can't vote for the next chief of staff. Yet they serve that chief of staff. Why? It's political status. That's a shame. The other one is the medical. It's not there in Guam. It's not there in Palau. It's not there in Koshere. What's going to happen in Tonga and American Samoa? I know American Samoa is having problems because they don't have a clinic, really. They need veteran help. And then what about Western Samoa? These guys are now U.S. citizens because the United States military opened their doors to non-U.S. citizens <coughs> over 10 years ago. And every year they stand up and say, I am a U.S. citizen. But they go home. And the Afghanistan war is going to end really soon. Everyone's going to go home. How are we going to serve those military people back in the islands? How are they going to get the same privileges? White House Initiative, this is for you. The Veterans Affairs, maybe you can collaborate with them and Department of Defense. But those are all major issues. Like I said, my, my home is Maryland. We have Guamayan people here. Those are the people that I relate but my passion is still in the island. There are other islanders here. Their passion is still with their island because their brother and sisters and their cousins and their mom and dads are still in the islands. So yes, consciousness here in the United States, it is here. The people like me and the rest of the, the Pacific Islanders who has power to vote for the congressmen and their senators and the president, we go to their congressmen and say, hey, when it comes to the island bu budgets, and policies, don't forget, don't forget Samoa, don't forget Hawaii, not Hawaii, don't forget Guam. I mean, yes, Hawaii, it's a state, but you know, <laughs> don't forget Guam, don't forget CNMI, don't forget the Marshall Islands, don't forget Palau, don't forget Truk. We have the power with our congressmen. Those islanders don't. So yes, we are participating. We are trying our best to articulate our island's needs to the politicians we have here that we are, we do have the right to tell them because we're the same right as the rest of the citizens here because we live here. Thank you very much. And <laughs> before, before I ask my colleagues to answer, I just wanted to ask, are you running for office? <laughs> okay. uh, care to respond? Sure, I, I won't, I don't know if you want to touch on the climate change but I'll, um, I'll speak a little bit about veterans' issues and um, just some of the work we've been doing with NGOs on the ground in the islands. So we have um, been working very closely with some of our federal agencies, you know, from the Health and Human Services, Department of Education, Department of Interior, even Department of Veterans Affairs. There is, as you may know, um, really a wonderful um, uh, uh, kind of growing segment of NGOs who are getting involved in issues around health and the economy and the, and the environment and domestic violence issues. Um, and we have been partnering with them to build those relationships uh, with directly with federal agencies. Uh, their concern is that there's a ton of work that needs to happen, um, but they're not getting the resources that they need. Uh, and you know, there's a more co just complicated issues from federal government to island governments to those individuals um, that run those nonprofits. My point is I think what's happening on the ground there is actually very good. And the, organiz um, the broad uh, collaborative organization is called Paiuta. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's actually based in Guam. Um, but in particular with, uh, with uh, veterans issues, I mean, that is something that we, that the Department of Veterans Affairs is very well aware. We do know that um, a disproportionate number of our Pacific Islanders uh, serve 
in this country, and we're very grateful and very proud um, of the fact that they have, you know, given their service and, in some cases, given their lives to, um, on behalf of this country. And as many of you may know, that there has been also uh, um, an impetus towards moving those who do serve um, to become citizens in this country. So. Uh, the challenge has been around building the facilities there uh, to, serve, uh, to serve those, to provide health care um, for the broader community, but also in particular for, for, for veterans. So um, I will go back and check exactly like what has happened specifically around the veterans piece, because I don't have an answer for you, um, other than this is an issue that has been raised with us before, specifically with veterans about having to go to Hawaii um, and to get health care. So I do thank you for your comments. I, I, just in terms of climate change, I, you know, I, I have to say that it's really over the, just the last four or five years that um, we've been ramping up our efforts in climate change. So, you know, of the, the vast majority of our budget that is going to the Pacific Islands uh, region is for climate change. And that's, as I said earlier, you know, while that's uh, it's approximately um, um, be like 70%, uh, almost $10 million a year. Um, there's, the only way we're going to have a real impact is if, if I said earlier about leveraging partnerships with not just other donors, but also with, with the governments and the local populations. Because a lot of the answers are there. And it's just about how do we, we um, bring them through. I think we have seen su successes as we've seen more and more islands using more renewable energy. And I think that's something we'll continue to promote. And we do have programs that are supporting that, and, for, and we are committed to that. I want to follow up. I, I'm going to go to this question here in a second, but I want to follow up with the question of non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, NCDs. Uh, I think they're responsible for um, what almost three quarters of the uh, of the deaths among um, in, in the Pacific. Is there connectivity there? Uh, can anyone talk to this issue? Probably Adam, again. <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, probably you. Sure, we, we have an HIV Great. program. Um, again, it's community-based. Uh, it's, it's right now focused in Papua New Guinea. Um, we are seeing some um, positive results just as of late. Um, but again, most of this is on public awareness. Um, we're not taking it, we haven't been able to take it to the level where we're actually providing medications and all that. Um, we're also trying, recognizing the challenges with gender to make that um, access to, um, to HIV um, education is more accessible to women in particular, as they're the ones who tend to be most impacted by it. Craig, you had a comment. Just a, a, a quick comment to say, um, just to, to pick up your point that uh, you know, around seven out of every 10 early or preventable deaths in the Pacific region are from uh, non-communicable diseases. So I think there is the potential there for greater um, collaboration in this area. There's already some great work going on. Mm. Um, we've been doing some work, tobacco control work in Samoa. We're also linked in with um, the US Center for Disease Control and the Department of Health and Human Services. So there's, there's a really good platform and a base there, but um, it, is a, it is the, as I said, the biggest killer in the, in the region of yeah. Pacific Islands people, and it is something that we really want to work with the region on. Um, with other partners to leverage, um, as Adam has said, um, for some outcomes because this is a, a, an important area about changing lives. And I would say, I mean, I think there's definitely an interest on our end. We've, um, in the past, held uh, philanthropic briefings focused on uh, the, the broader Asian Pacific Islander community. We held a very large briefing with about 200 foundation representatives um, and federal officials last year um, at the White House, and then we've also gone to Hawaii twice for a Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, so there were um, Pacific Islander leaders who were flown in to Hawaii to meet with foundations and to start having the discussion about some of the issues. So I do, th I think, in the sense of um, building partnerships and also um, not only the resources from the federal government, but I do think uh, foundations and other partners can be much more nimble um, and, uh, and sometimes a lot faster. Um, and, and, and work in providing those resources. And I think that there's some real opportunities there. I do think that uh, uh, there needs to be some level of education about what those issues are and, 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 and really uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, enticing or you know, just really creating the interest um, um, to pay attention to, the, to this 
Pacific Islands. Thank you very much. Uh, the hand back here. I can't see that. Oh, there she is. Talo Falava, my name is Charity Anna Prozzano, and I'm from American Samoa. I'm a second grade teacher there. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for um, giving us this opportunity to talk about Pacific issues and for a young person like myself to learn about what issues that are facing the Pacific. And so today, I've heard efforts that Pacific leaders are taking to address conservation and environmental issues. But I'd like to hear about how Pacific leaders are addressing education issues. Yes, the environment is our economy and vice versa, but education is our future. So I'm just curious to find out what are problems other Pacific Islanders are facing within their education system and how have leaders um, taken steps to address those issues? Thank you. Education. Oh, I'm to make. Yeah. Go ahead, Craig. Um, hello, Falava. Uh, I hesitate to speak on behalf of leaders, but I will speak um, um, as an official. Um, there, the the, the um, Pacific Islands Forum has an education ministers meeting, which is um, a, and they meet and they run, a, a, I guess, a forum basic education action plan, and. Uh, this is a sector that has some very, very good coordination and you know, Australia, New Zealand, um, the UNESCO are supporting, for example, are supporting, I guess, better education outcomes. There are both access issues and there are quality issues across the region. And again, it's hard to generalise because the region, as you all know, is diverse. So, uh, you know, and there are some countries independent, some countries have special relationships. So one size does not fit all. But just as a, just an example around access, um, in the last couple of years, um, donors have supported the region, so there are now no fees in the Solomon Islands, in Samoa, and um, uh, in Vanuatu. So it's free fee education in those countries. So one issue around access, particularly that was also affecting girls, um, has now been um, overcome. So the focus in those countries is now quality, because we also know it needs about trained teachers um, so there are some major initiatives, and in, I, I, again, speaking from the, um, the southern Pacific Islands around education, um, uh, in terms of trying to raise ed education quality and access. Thank you. Uh, in the back, uh, all the way back here. Thank you. No, we'll get you a microphone right behind you there. Oh, great. Thank you. But thanks for offering to shout. That was I got some lungs, so why not use them? Brian Miller, uh, born in Papua New Guinea, slight hybrid because I'm from Ohio as well. <laughs> <laughs> Similar in some ways. Um, so this is largely for Mr. Kagan, uh, Secretary, or regarding State Department. I was wondering, you mentioned a couple of times Secretary Clinton's focus on the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, this rebalancing. I'm wondering how that has already changed or is likely to change under Secretary Kerry. And secondly, uh, moving forward, how can we in this room help ensure that the Pacific and Asian, um, that region continues to be a priority moving forward, especially with other priorities that continually assert themselves in the Middle East and elsewhere? Thanks. Great question. Thank, Thank you. Um, We've gotten to the heart of the issue, which is, of course, sustainable. Um, I think that, oh, you know, you. very clearly, the balance is the president's policy and the agenda is the course set by the president. Um, and I think you've seen the president show a great deal of focus on the Asia Pacific. Yeah, show a great deal of focus on the Asia Pacific in the last, um, in the last uh, six months. I think Secretary Kerry has been to Asia once, um, will be going again. Um, and I think he also is very interested in a number of issues that are very clearly at the intersection, uh, or where they intersect in to many ways, is in the Pacific region, um, particularly having to do with um, oceans and environment, um, also <coughs> World War II legacies. Um, so I think that what the challenge is going to be, of course, how do you compete given the demands everywhere. And that's never an easy thing to do. And you know, there's never a one-size-fits-all approach. 
I think that the real thing is to show that this is a priority, and it's a priority not out of charity, and I think this is very important. The U.S. isn't just doing this for the region. We're also doing this for ourselves. This is a region that is important to us and that does matter. Um, and it matters on a number of levels. One is very clearly a people. And I, you know, I was thrilled to hear what you said because I think that's something that often is forgotten, is how many Pacific Islanders serve in the U.S. military, obviously from the U.S. territories, but also from the freely associated states. And that's something that we're deeply honored by and humbled by their continuing faith and their commitment to the United States. I think that we have, long, we have the growth of um, communities in the United States, and that's also very important for us. And in that regard, I think people here, are, you are all potentially able to play a very important role in making clear that this is a priority for you. Um, because you know, we're not just talking about the State Department, we're not just talking about the U.S. government, we're talking about the broader community uh, in the United States, and to realize that there is sustained support for engagement in the region. I think that's very important. But I think that the critical thing is that we have to be effective in what we do. And that means collaborating within our government. And, you know, it's no lies, it's no surprise, that's not always the easiest thing to do. It's, always it, it's also important to collaborate with our partners and in the region and other donors and outside players. And I think that this is something that we've tried very hard to ramp up and to be more effective at. Clearly, it's a work in progress. And we're going to have to keep doing more. But I think what you'll see is that we will continue to do that because we recognize the only way we partners. Okay, did the gentleman in the red shirt have a question? Oh, I see, okay, okay, okay. So uh, I've been encouraged, actually urged, from the back of the room, I get these hand cues, to, to uh, wrap up here, and I will, uh, because I think there's a ray of sunshine, and uh, man, when the sun shines, it's time for a reception to start uh, <laughs> on Pacific Day. So I don't want to get between you and the reception, but Please join me in thanking this fantastic panel for their class. Thank you very much. I, I just, just a thought as you go in and, ha and enjoy each other and enjoy the, the beautiful uh, hospitality of the New Zealand Embassy. Think about this. I think collaboration, uh, there, there needs to be a narrative. There needs to be a story. Uh, and everyone here is going to have to work together to be part of telling that story if we're going to keep the Asia Pacific on the top of the agenda and, the, and particularly the Pacific. So uh, we all have work to do and we all have work to do together. So thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.